So I have, so I started my over like, you know, software engineering by contributing to open source at Mozilla, like basically the task cluster project. And I worked as a front end engineer at uh, startups like Createla, Buki, and, and lately I worked at Feeds as a full stack engineer. And, you know, I love meeting people and I am trying to be, trying to be a better at fitness. And also I like to, you know, dance. Not going to be, not going to get into the dance forms yet. <laughs> Okay, anyways, so yeah, so migrating partially from Apollo to URQL in a Next.js application. So I did this project uh, in at Feeds and I solely worked on this project and I will be sharing about the journey, the learnings, technical and also, you know, how to solve a problem. So first of all, I would like to know how many of you have worked with, you make your hands dirty with GraphQL. Okay, one, two, three, four. <laughs> Okay, and how many of you uh, like are uh, like have uh, know about Next.js? Have worked something? Okay, seems a bit better. <laughs> cool. So maybe I have to also tell a bit about GraphQL before telling other things. Mm, okay, all right. So yeah. So basically, if you know what GraphQL is, I am going to just brief it out since you are not aware. Okay. So you know what REST APIs is, right? I mean, you get, you hit an endpoint and you get results. But what with graph, but the disadvantage of REST API is that you have a specific endpoint and sometimes there's a problem of overfetching. Like suppose I just, suppose I am, I'm getting some data about a user and maybe in the date, in the, I just want the name and the, maybe just the name and maybe the college or the roll number or something. And I don't want the end, all the details of the, you know, the user, but even with, even without, you know, with the rest API, you have to get all the data, even though you don't want all the data. So it's results in, you know, the loss of like, there is more uh, network requests, you know, more overload, more data you're fetching. So it leads to more data and, you know, bad performance. So that's why there is something called GraphQL. So yeah, so uh, you can say it's like a query language, which is heavily used in a lot of projects, even like F Facebook uses is and a lot of projects are using it. So what this does is that, so the query is something like this, suppose, yeah. So suppose there is a, uh, you know, I think I can give a better example than this. Let me check. Mm. Okay. So what happens is that suppose you have, these are basically type user and type post is a schema. And suppose there is, uh, this is like the user as these are the their types like name, ID, image URL posts and array of posts. Like the user can have multiple posts. And then there is a type post, which has all the data. Now what happens with GraphQL is suppose I just want, suppose for post, there is a lot of things, you know, right? ID, text, post, at, author, like, by, and there could be suppose thing, there are 10 other fields. But with GraphQL, I have the flexibility of only fetching data what my, me, uh, what I require. Suppose for like by, you see there is ID, name, and image URL. For like, like by is basically an array of users, right? So I just want the basic details of the user. Now, if I want, I can even further, you know, if I want that all the people who have liked those posts, I want even the more details of those users that what those users have posted. I can even, you know, further query, you know, further nested and I will get more details. So that's the flexibility you get. You just get the data as much as you want. Now coming to caching, you know, like there are two basic, like why you need caching? Because when you're querying graphical data, you don't want the network request to go again and again, if it's already in the cache. And with graphical, what happens is that it's not like an HTTP caching where, you know, you have an endpoint and you get the results. Yeah, you, these are post requests. Like when you do a graphical, it's like you hit the graphical endpoint and all the queries, you know, the query, just the, the example, which I gave, uh, those are go, those goes into the body of the graph, graphical post request. So you need to cache those things. So now there are clients, basically what are clients is like clients, uh, cl there are like Apollo clients, URQL or relay. So how many of you have worked, uh, have heard of Apollo client? All right. Yeah, cool. So basically with what, uh, so, so there are multiple clients to work with UR, uh, like a graphical one is Apollo, URQL and Relay and Apollo is, I think, most widely used. 
so with uh, with these clients help you in a lot of things and one of the things is like caching the graphql queries so now there are basically two types of graphql queries caching mechanism one is the normalized caching which is used by both, all of them apollo urql and relay and there is something called document caching which is only you know uh, available with the use of the urql client now let's you know differentiate how this caching things works the first is that i mean i think i'm making it a graphql com but i will get back to the action <laughs> so what happens is that when you are getting a query suppose uh, that you are getting a query this is how in normalized caching the data goes you know like when you get the data uh, th if you see on the right side i mean your left side you will see this is how the data is stored in the cache the type name and the id if you see here the key of the cache like cache is a key value store so the it has the type name of it has a key of, which is a combination of the type of the data the type name and the id it is like a unique identifier and so you see the data which i get from this query from this get user query in the cache this is how the data is stored you see user as user and with the id of 122 and there are posts so here is what makes normalized caching very performant uh instead of directly storing the post it stores the references of the post and the, the each of the post is again stored with a different key and value like post 23 and it has the values and similarly so what is the advantage of that basically data redundancy you get rid of data redundancy just like a database has two tables and you have a foreign key that's how uh instead of actually storing the data in one table you just point it you know you store the reference so now you have a mutation query like suppose like post so mutation is basically like an you know update operation so i'm liking the post suppose post 23 and i am the user 122 who is liking that post so what the result how is the cache updated you see post 23 now has in the like by field you will see there is an additional uh user like user 122 so you uh, so what advantage is that you don't have to again store the user the user 122 is already in the cache so you just you know just keep add the reference and if that user was not there suppose it was user 755 then it would just create that user and it will just point to a reference so that how that's how it you know improves the uh, it's much more performant now coming to document caching document caching is like very simple and raw so if you see it uh, like it just it just stringifies your query and the variables you know the variables are like for example for this the variable was id 122 it's like a json object so it it just stringifies the query and uh, variables and just makes a hash and it just makes things simpler and you know yeah this is how it has a key you know the hash value of that instead of stringifying the query and the variable and it keeps the result so in this case what happens if you make a mutate of like post you see here it's just storing the entire data and obviously when you are storing the entire data it's not storing the reference you see when i like that post i am getting additional user data entirely in the post itself so obviously you know normalized caching is more performant but where is you know where is document caching most more useful something like content heavy sites uh, so for normalized caching if you talk about facebook it is very dynamic application right you are adding posts you are creating posts uh, it's very dynamic a lot of states are getting changed but for content heavy sites where you are you know more consuming content and rather not you know you are not exactly updating anything there you are just consuming content for those things document caching can really work so giving you an example suppose just give you an example where i think i actually wanted to find you know exactly what production apps are there you are which are using document caching but i couldn't find it yet you know last minute so suppose this is an app like a demo app and suppose this is a react application uh, i mean this is not a react application but suppose this is a react application and for websites like this suppose you go to the courses and yeah so this is kind of a something where document caching could work 
because there is something called contentful like there are content management systems where the content is the like the content is separated like suppose the marketing team creates some content and you don't really writing the content in the code you are just fetching the data from the some content provider which some other team could be writing and you're just posting suppose for this app so this is a react app and you know the maybe the instructor is writing the course and you are just fetching the data so in cases like this uh, the content will provide some graphical api and you just fetch the data and you know there is not much interactions in the app like the content is from external provider and in that case you can you know use document caching and the other advantage of document caching is that if you are using urql the bundle size uh now urql has a bundle size of about 8 kilobytes if you are not using the normalized cache but if you are using you know apollo or something 32 kilobytes so it's you know in terms of bundle size apollo is pretty huge so if your application suppose just requires something like this you don't need to bother about normalized caching and if you think document caching is enough you can start with urql and obviously this is how urql works so it has something like exchanges if you are aware of Apo if you are know of apollo apollo has something like apollo links similar to that urql has something like exchanges so you know redux right redux has something like a middleware like lot of middlewares to process the data so similarly uh, urql has exchanges so when you make a graphql query or a graphql mutation it passes through different exchanges like so and so forth exchanges and it goes to the network and it comes back and this is how, what's the flexibility which only urql provides in comparison to apollo is that if you want document caching you can use that exchange and if you think at certain point your app is requiring graph cache you can like the document cache is the default cache of the urql but if it it starts the app becomes complex and it has a requirement of uh, normalized caching you can just you know install a new package of graph cache and you can just plug it in so this is how you know how it works uh, like you are initiating a urql client and there are an array of packages now if you want to support server side rendering so your app support server side rendering in that case you you add an exchange of ssr and you know and it's done you know it adds that functionality now coming to i guess you all know about react suspense so without having the react suspense feature what happens is that suppose you have a so this is basically a next js application you know like the page component of the next js and you are requiring data uh, from the graphql query and this is a variable and you get two datas one is data and is the is loading state so this is like a pattern so if suppose there is no data if the if it's still loading it shows the loader and if The 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 is no more loading the data is fetched it returns the component so this is like a very basic pattern but with suspense for data fetching if such uh, if it supports both in client and server side your code would be much simpler suppose there is suspense there is fallback and you literally get rid of the you know you get rid of the loading state you don't have to care about uh, you don't have to care about whether the data is loading or not because whenever the data is loading uh it just of fallbacks to the loader so it's kind of an you know you don't have to keep there is no code uh, duplication of that same logic but suppose now like this you a uh, use query hook you to see is from urql like if you are using the you are react urql hook suppose for certain urql queries suppose you need to you need more customization just like the loader which i saw if load it's loading to a different loader or something for so certain cases like that you have the flexibility you can pass you know inside the use query you can pass a parameter of uh, like suspense equals to true so even if the sus suspense equals to false so even if globally you have turned suspense on for data fetching for specific queries you can still turn off the suspense and you can you know in that case you can use those a loading state and you can do more customizations now there are two things uh, if you are using urql there are two things one is you use the package called next urql and there is something called react ssr prefetch pass okay so the reason why why i chose urql like why we thought of migrating from apollo to urql was because 
the thing which I showed here. So the suspense for data fetching both on client and the server is only supported in URQL as of now. Like Apollo has recently started an RFC, I think, which is still a work in progress. But when I walk like one year back, URQL is the only thing and still it's the only one which supports suspense even for the, you know, the server side. And for that, let's dive into some internals. So it, you, so how does it, you know, support suspense in the backend? So the next URQL has a, so if you see, let's go to the code. Yeah, I think it's visible or maybe I need to. Is it visible now? Yeah, cool. So like this is basically the package, like I dive deep into the package. So there is next URQL and this with URQL client wrapper. Now, if you see here that they are using something here down, something called SSR prepass. Pre so like the next SSR prepass package. So what it does is that when, when you are, you are turning, you know, suspend on for the server side as well, because of this, uh, uh, because of the SSR PFAS, what is this is that like uh, when it's going through the, uh, re when it's going through the, it walks down the react tree basically, and it looks for all the places where, you know, where all the GraphQL queries are. So this is basically when you are doing server side rendering. So, you know, when you are server side rendering, you want, it's better to have all your GraphQL queries already, you know, fetched at the, also at the uh, backend, you know, and thus uh, while rendering and just return the entire th uh, HTML to the front end. So in that case, for, for making that possible, what SSR pass does is that it go, uh, the app tree is basically the top React component. It walks through the React tree and whenever it finds that there's a, uh, you know, the GraphQL query is still, like in simpler terms, the GraphQL query is still fetching results. It just waits, waits, at, uh, waits at that point and only when all the GraphQL queries uh, you know, are resolved and uh, only then, you know, this entire SSR PPAS guest, you know, it uh, gets resolved. So you already, when you are returning the data in the front end, all the graphical queries are already fetched and you don't get the loader on the first initial uh, loading. Uh, I mean, first initial render. Okay, coming to this. So you guys know of higher order components, right? I mean, yeah. So basically when, uh, so we already had Apollo. So when you migrate from one app, you know, you are adding a new library or some things and you want to migrate from one technology to other, you obviously can't get rid of it completely. And, you know, and you just plug uh, one thing, you, you, when it's a big application, basically. So what you do is that you partially migrate. Maybe you take certain pages, certain parts of the app where you start using a new technology and you gradually migrate and also experiment. So that's what we did. Like we already had Apollo and we introduced URQL. So what we could do here is that I really love this pattern basically like install. So install is a higher order component. Now for certain pages where we are, we were using URQL, we just use this higher order component and we just set you are able to true and wherever we are not using it, like it doesn't exist. So in that way, we were only using URQL in pages, you know, we were just loading the library where we required and where we not. And I think I just love this, inst this install pattern. So it's basically a higher order component and it only installs the modules which are required if you set it to true. Okay. So one challenge when I was migrating was that, uh, like the migration was going good, but one thing is even when I was ha after logging out of the application, you need to reset the cache, right? Because you don't want the profile, like whenever you sign out, you get, you want the cache to be refreshed and you don't want the profile data to t still exist because it's a completely new view. So, but even after logging out, the profile data was still there. Though somewhere, you know, we were doubts like why it's not happening. Though the first thing which, so this is how the code was. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 
I don't know. I don't know why it's not zooming. Okay, maybe it's the picture. Cool. Is it visible anyway? Like if is it visible or not? Okay. Okay, there's a better way. Cool. Yeah. Okay, so basically this is the place where we you know initialize the URL uh, library and had a provider here. This is the code basically. So we uh, so whenever we uh, when so this is the props. So we were getting these two pro uh, like whenever we were using this URL client wrapper. Uh, from the library itself, we get two props. One is the URL client and one is the resale URL client uh, to, you know, to reset the URL client basically. And since it was inside a provider, we wanted access outside the, you know, outside the React application. So what we did is that so it basically takes this and it just sets the uh, sets it in external variables so that you can access it even outside the provider. So, so I was very much worried that maybe somewhere here it was going wrong that why this was not happening, why the URL cache was not getting updated. And obviously after one, maybe after a few weeks of, you know, blaming it on yourself and checking, maybe my implementation was wrong. Maybe you start looking at the library, maybe the library has certain bugs or something. So in that case, what you do is that the, how you can derive at the conclusion that, you know, it's your fault or it's the library's fault is just take that like uh, that tech, uh, library what you are using and uh, you just just uh, you know have a simpler project maybe a hello world project or like that and you use that and you use that uh, maybe library in that application like a simpler um, you can say a minimal viable product as you say and you experiment with that library in that and you come to the conclusion whether it's the app or whether it's the library which is causing the bug. And it turns out that there were certain issues with the library. Yeah, so in that case, I figured out and, you know, uh, like sending a pull request to, you know, that this is the issue and these are the fixes. I don't know how much you will actually try to, uh, you will get it if I try to explain you what was the fault. Yeah, I mean, but yeah, so these are like, these are the basic two things which were like, fixes kind of which we thought that it will fix the thing and why and also at the same time we were you know an urgent to deploy the things to production so what we did that that unless the the you know the pr was uh, the pr was merged we just use my branch temporarily in the package or json until that get resolved so that was like a quick fix but unfortunately even after all these fixes like still there were certain things we still the logout was not working and we, what the conclusion was that it's not going to get fixed, kind of. So like this is what I, this, what happens is that there's, if you have a pause operation, you know, pause is basically something which you get with, which if you want to pause the URL operation, basically, suppose uh, for this use, use my account, obviously if you're not logged up, logged in, you don't want to even use that, you know, get profile data app, Query, so you can just pause the operation, and this what happens is that whenever you are going from you know from pause state to unpause, like from unpause state to pause state after logout or something, uh, because of how the URL is drawn, like it's still not going to get fixed, and so the solution was to just just refresh the page after logout. <laughs> yeah, so that you know, just and anyway, it's not a bad user experience because people do expect that if you sign out, the page gets refreshed. So yeah. That's it. And these are my handles if you want to. Thank you.